Jeff Lauer here. I'm uh, pleased to introduce our webinar for today, which is Brain Injury and Sleep. Uh, the United States Brain Injury Alliance is, uh, has a mission to engage the community, both in the prevention of brain injury and improving people's lives. We have state members around the country. These are state organizations that share the same mission and provide a range of services, supports, prevention, education, and advocacy at the state level. And we also have advocate members, uh, individuals who join the organization that are interested in A, receiving information, rapid, reliable, and relevant information about brain injury, but who also may be interested in advocating for systems change, both at the local, state, and uh, national level. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Lauer. I'm the executive director and CEO of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa and also the chair elect of the United States Brain Injury Alliance. And today, it's my great pleasure to welcome um, two of our uh, colleagues, uh, Drs. Dyken and Immen. Uh, Dr. Eric Dyken is a professor of neurology at the University of Iowa Healthcare uh, in the Carver College of Medicine, Department of Neurology. He directs the sleep disorders program and clinic. Dr. Dyken has spent his career studying and treating individuals with patients with sleeping problems. And today he's among a uh, team of doctors at the, United, at the University of Iowa who with researchers in the Institute of uh, Neuroscience, the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, are plowing in, tunneling their way into the mysterious processes that work during sleep and that pre, uh, play a crucial role in such areas as memory, recovery, development, and health. Uh, Dr. Rachel Immen is uh, just finishing up her residency and fellowship training in both family practice and psychiatry, um, completing a sleep medicine fellowship. She transla transitions next week uh, to be able to share her expertise in the family sleep clinic where she'll be providing sleep medicine via telemedicine all through the internet for patients located both in Iowa and Illinois. Her focus in her practice will be insomnia, but she'll also be focused on treating other sleep disorders such as uh, restless leg syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea. I should say that Dr. Immonen was recently recognized by her colleagues and also by the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine for excellence in her instruction and teaching capacity. So congratulations for that award. Um, so today we want to have a, a conversation with uh, our, these medical experts around sleep. And one of the first questions that I want to pose to you is, why the heck do we sleep? I mean, what's the point? It seems like a dangerous activity for um, humans or other animals uh, and a waste of time for those of us who have that whole chunk of the, of the day. That, why do we sleep? So the question would be, would you die if you didn't sleep? And the answer would be yes. Uh, it's a restorative process. And uh, I just gave a lecture to our neurology residents. That's the big board question. And Dr. Rechtstoffen, who's an iconic sleep researcher, and he gets into the ethics of animal research. But if you sleep deprive an animal, it will die from sepsis. There is something restorative. And they used sleep deprivation as torture. And we know what torture it is, and that's why we're here today, not to get good sleep or any sleep at all. So it is a mandated, we need air, we need food, and we need sleep. And without sleep, the studies show animals really can't survive without sleep. Okay, so it's restorative and it's essential to being able to maintain life. Are there any creatures that don't sleep? None that we know of. There's always a parallel. Uh, they may not sleep like we do. Hmm. Insects, etc. Hibernation, uh, burrowing, the uh, cicada. What was that? 19 year cicada. I mean, what are they really doing? But there's a parallel with almost any known organism of stasis of sleep for restoration so that the motor don't burn out, if you will. Indeed. So that restorative component um, probably plays a bit, a bit of havoc, and there's havoc with it when brain injury. So why, why is sleep so commonly disrupted? Well, you know, and I'm asking my bias. Is there, is there the, the, ma the master organ is the brain. 
and throughout the brain and the brainstem. And many of us uh, and gone through rehabilitation from traumatic brain injury. There's a reticular activating system, an area of the brain that keeps us awake or keeps us asleep. And the brain is the master organ and so many areas can be affected that are sleep and wake related that it's not unusual to find people with even mild traumatic brain injury with major sleep related problems. Hmm. Thank you. What about the difference between uh, the two of you, uh, men and women? Do, do men and women have characteristics that are different in sleep and particularly is there a difference after brain injury? I, and I'll just make one statement, then I'll let the boss speak <laughs> a little bit. I, I had looked this up earlier, but in mild traumatic brain injury and concussion, female gender, and remember, gender's a choice, but female gender predicts that within a two-week period, if you have problems with sleep, you probably have more chronic persistent sleep disturbance. It's not fair, but uh, insomnia, there just seems to be a little bit to more female gender. Hmm. What do you think? I was going to say the same thing. I would say <laughs> brain injury probably amplifies some of the differences we see in men and women at baseline. So women have a predisposition towards more insomnia men towards sleep apnea, and I think brain injury really amplifies those differences. Yep. Helpful. So you mentioned a, a phrase a, a minute ago about insomnia. What is insomnia, doc, Dr. Iman? What is, I mean, if I, if I wake up for a half an hour uh, in the middle of the night and I think about the fact that I needed, I haven't had my oil changed in the last uh, six months and it starts bugging me, but then I get back to sleep. Um, is that insomnia? What is it? What's what is and what is not insomnia? So that's a great question. And I think a very simple way of thinking about insomnia is if your sleep is not good quality and it uh, gives you a bad experience and poor wakefulness during the day. Mm -hmm. If you look at it a little bit more in detail, you could say insomnia is trouble falling asleep. So taking more than 15, 20 minutes to fall asleep can be one piece of insomnia. Waking up through the night is normal. However, it should just be a few moments, kind of a, a sleepy wake time, and, and shouldn't really last that half an hour. You shouldn't get to the point where you're thinking about the car maintenance that needs to be done. So waking up through the night can be a part of insomnia. For other people, insomnia can also include um, waking up too early. So, you know, you don't need to get up until 6 or 7 a.m., but you find yourself awake at 3 or 4 a.m. and unable to fall back asleep. So waking, um, difficulty falling asleep, waking up through the night, or waking up too early for the day. Thank you. You know, I read somewhere uh, some time ago that before the advent of electricity, that um, there was a phrase called first sleep and second sleep, where people would have a period of wakefulness during the night and often get up and um, uh, perform some activities before going back to sleep. Is, is that a thing still? It is. So um, that first sleep and second sleep, some people also call it bimodal sleeping. Um, and we wonder if that went back to a time where you need to get up through the night and stoke the fire or possibly um, make some morning preparations at, at a, a middle of the night time. It, for some people, is um, a way of sleeping that we still see persist, but typically if there's a bimodal sleeper or first, second sleep individual, uh, they have a very different experience. They may wake up at a routine time through the night, um, but it's not bothersome. Um, they feel pleasantly awake, and it's pretty easy to fall back asleep at a, t a predictable time, and their total sleep time is a good quality, a, a good amount of sleep. So it's not unusual that people may wake up occasionally at night. Not unusual. Yeah. Okay, helpful. So don't panic um, if, yeah. if, you, if you wake up uh, sometimes at night. There are some normal variations, yes. Helpful, helpful. So again, uh, we don't have to pathologize uh, everything that's not a go to sleep within 10 minutes and sleep the whole night through and there you go. Right. Um, particularly, uh, there's a question actually, 
um, that, that has to do with waking up at night. I'm gonna jump into a specific question, but there's an individual who writes that his uh, sleep is bothered or interrupted by having to get up um, to offload some liquids uh, uh, two or, or three times a night. And so his sleep is not as constant because he has to get up to use the bathroom. Um, he's found some pills that uh, can lessen that urge to, uh, to void, but wondering if getting up and having to go to the bathroom is going to be what, uh, have an impact on his daily fatigue level. Well, as serendipity, we just had grand rounds by a good friend of mine, uh, 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 and, uh, Dr. Perlman, Amy Perlman over here at the University of Iowa from Urology. Okay. So, you know where I'm going with this. What do old guys do like me? Uh, and what gets worse? The prostate. And when the prostate gets bigger, and it will, you got up to go pee at night. But then she looked over at me, and we refer to each other all the time. There are things urologically, as you get older, as a male, to get up, to have nocturia. But she said, no, Dr. Dykin, uh, what's the first thing you would do with this patient's complaint? And I said, I'd look at his weight. I looked down the back of his throat, see if he's got sleep apnea, because sleep apnics who stop breathing for a lot of interesting reasons tend to get up and go pee at night. Huh. A colleague of mine said, well, wait a second. Uh, what's their blood sugar level? And have they been seeing a doctor for their diabetes? Well, well, that's another thing. And the other person says, you know, I love marathons. I love to drink water a lot right before I go. How much water are you drinking before you go to sleep? My father-in-law, he's 92, says, I don't drink water before I go to sleep because I don't like to get five million different things. So what you do in medicine, it's based upon history and exam. So when you hear that simple history, be careful when any healthcare professional over a webinar or anywhere says, there's your answer. You got to take a full history and it could be so many different things. Sure. Well, thank you. That's, that is helpful. So there's a, there's a bit of a rabbit hole that people do need to go down to try to unpack the potential nuances about what might be underlying. And this question about fatigue um, comes up a lot with brain injury. Uh, in the in talking with people with brain injury and family members, particularly from anything from mild to concussion uh, to some more severe brain injury, the characteristic of being tired or kind of running out of gas in the afternoon is, is not that unusual. Does that have anything to do with the restorative capacity of a night's sleep, and there's a question about can it be addressed by taking naps? Would that help to either um, compensate for not sleeping well and or would that help to lessen fatigue? I think we could segue into Dr. Immons, one of her many expertise, but when you hear fatigue, yeah. fatigue is beauty in the eyes of the beholder. And for our football players that are doing four a days, it could be that they're exhausted because they're doing four a days, no matter how much they slept. Okay. It could be because people with traumatic brain injury tend to underestimate, and people without traumatic brain injury, brain injury their degree of sleepiness. Mm. We also know there are tremendous comorbidities that you and I have talked about after brain injury. One of them is mood disorder. Is it fatigue? Is it depression? Is it so many different things? And as such, the differential often comes to the general family medicine or psychiatrist. What do you think if you have that complaint? So I think that it's another simple <laughs> um, question that is actually really complicated in its answer. There are kind of two categories I would think about it. There's one category that is a lot of underlying issues that might be contributing to the fatigue during the day. So an untreated sleep disorder like sleep apnea, which we know is worse after brain injury or more likely. Um, untreated insomnia, which we also know is more likely and worse after brain injury. Mm -hmm. Depression, which is related to brain injury. So many medical problems can be contributing to daytime sleepiness. That's one category. The other category is, um, like Dr. Dyken mentioned, we know that brain injury changes the brain in a lot of ways. And uh, one thing that it does regarding sleep and fatigue is decrease hypocretin levels. And they are just low by themselves without a clear explanation 
Um, we do know they tend to recover over time, over months and years, and they tend to improve if we can fix some of the other problems going on. But that low hypocretin level um, can lead to just a really heavy fatigue without really any other explanation. But you can't just immediately say it's that. You really need to look at all the other possibilities. Yeah, I think one of the things you've alluded to twice is yeah, be careful when you hear something on the night news, read it in Time Magazine, whatever it might be. There are great healthcare professionals, uh, ARNPs, PACs, DEOs, MDs, people who, PhDs trained in sleep medicine. And I think sometimes we need an expert. We know that if we lift weights, our muscles will get bigger, but if we want to make it to the Olympics, if we really want to improve our health, sometimes we do need to talk to an expert. They need to take a full history, and sometimes they need to look under the hood, just like a good mechanic, to bring all these elements together. Is it sleepiness? Is it fatigue? Or is your blood sugar out of control and you got diabetes? times 5 million other potential differential problems. So that really brings up, a, a, how do I want to say this, uh, well, the conundrum, but also a, another uh, component or, or part of the pendulum for the worried well among us um, and that are potentially out amongst the uh, rural parts of Iowa, Montana, Washington State that might not have easy access to an expert who could look under our hoods. What are the basics to treating ourselves well? Uh, something I've read about called sleep hygiene. Uh, what are the, the handful of things that are red flags um, for doing, waking up at night and checking my email? Um, I remember hearing you talk once, Dr. Dykin, about using the brightest light source available to us during the day, get out and have the, not just enjoy the sunshine, but uh, get, so what are the things that we can do that improve our odds about having healthy sleep habits? And, and um, if that were to resolve, we might not have to travel a distance to get a, a sleep consult. What do you think? So there are many. <clears throat> I would say I'm actually a little bit of an anti-sleep hygiene person. Okay. Um, I, I think that sleep hygiene is wonderful, but ultimately it typically doesn't improve sleep, unfortunately. And, and make sure you explain to the audience yeah. what you mean, because that just almost sounds hygiene. like, I yeah. don't like happiness and joy. Sleep hygiene is different from what I think you're gonna talk about. Right, so sleep hygiene is a specific kind of um, environmental things that people try. So they say, oh, I, I don't have the TV on, and my room is dark, um, my room is cool. All those things that are kind of, they seem like environmental pieces of good sleep. Yeah. You can improve all of those and still have terrible sleep, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, so I do think that having a sleeping environment that's comfortable and cues you to sleep is important, but we always talk about the father of sleep medicine, Dr. Dement, who talks about all the time that he sleeps with the TV on. Um, so I, I do think that having an environment that cues sleep is important, but what that environment is does not have to be something uniform across all people. Okay. Um, if you're going to just look at insomnia and what are some helpful things, if, if we kind of rule out, maybe I'll let Dr. Dyken talk about um, sleep apnea, which would be another really important part of healthy sleep. But if you're just looking at insomnia, either trying to prevent it or remedy it, what you want to look at is um, the red flags being trouble falling asleep, waking up through the night, or waking up too early. If you don't have one of those, you probably don't need to worry too much about insomnia. Okay. Whether you have the TV on or not. Um, if you do have one of those, then you need to start to work to get rid of that problem. And the best, the simplest way I can say it is if you're awake, you should be out of bed. And if you're asleep, you get to be in bed. That's about as, as simple as I could maybe bring it down to. So I don't lay in bed awake for two hours to fall asleep. Don't lay in bed awake for two hours in the middle of the night or for an hour in the morning if you wake up too early. If you're awake, just get out of bed. Go do something else in a different room. Does it matter, Dr. Riman, what you do? If I, if I went to read versus going out and uh, cutting firewood with my chainsaw, would it make any difference? 
So uh, I'm glad that you used those two examples. I think generally quiet activities are a good choice. Some people say like, oh, can I go watch Netflix or does the blue light or light exposure, you know, negatively impact my sleep. Truthfully, if it's a calm, quiet activity that you enjoy, I don't worry too much. But I do uh, advise, you know, nothing that's going to get your heart rate going, nothing that's going to give you a, lots of bright light. Um, keep it calm. So the shining might not be the top uh, Netflix no. movie to go for. No. It's some boring. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Um, what about napping uh, in terms of trying to make up for lost sleep or the impact of napping on sleep it, before or with or without brain injury, but particularly with brain injury? Do you have any thoughts about if napping is something people should be doing? Well, you know, what do they do, you know, in almost uh, in, in certain cultures, uh, South America, uh, South Korea, uh, our colleague, Dr. M, when we went there, uh, they closed down shop at noon because physiologically, biologically, we have two periods of most sleepiness over a 24 hour period of the way we're made right around one to three in the afternoon, the siesta period that we all have heard about and right around one to three in the morning when we should be sound asleep. So one of the thoughts is if you're in South Korea, yeah, you're taking that noon period off either to have a long lunch or take a nap. You come into work early and you stay at work late. It's a different culture and lifestyle, but it's taking care of something on a routine, habitual basis that works with your society. When you've had traumatic brain injury, if that's not been your habit, if that's not been your culture, I parallel that with as I'm getting older in geriatric medicine. I used to be a nurse's assistant. And when my older patients were sleeping during the day, it was easier for me because I had so many people to take care of. One of the problems with older patients and brain injured patients, especially acutely and severe, is when they're asleep, it's easier to get all your work done but then they lose their sleep drive for the night. So that paradoxically, people with severe brain injury and cognitive element and older individuals, they often have sundowning. Uh, they're wide awake, maybe even their behavior, maybe even more confused when they should be asleep because hmm. a lot of that normal sleep drive, that tendency to sleep at night has been diminished because they've been sleeping all day. And then in addition, often on medications, often with comorbidities like depression, et cetera. And you and I had talked about this. Sometimes if you have the druthers and you're getting good sleep at night, take a walk outside because the bright light of midday has an effect through the eyes, which is an extension of the brain, which has been injured to decrease a lot of neurotransmitters, including melatonin, which is a normal endogenous hormone we've all heard about. It's the sleepy hormone that gets high when it gets dark. Get out, take a walk. It's also exciting. You see things, you stimulate yourself. We know that exercise, walking increases core body temperature and the deeper stages of sleep at night. But sometimes when we're depressed from brain injury, we have more of a tendency to have insomnia and sleepiness. We stay locked in. We may be on medicines that are sedating, and it's a vicious cycle of just spiraling. So sometimes a nap may not be a good thing. But if you're driving a truck, which weighs 40 tons, and you're about to fall asleep, I'd have you pull over to a rest station and take a power nap, and we can talk about Dr. Moss's from Cornell University on the East Coast, his power nap method that might keep you alive on the highway when you're driving that truck. So it depends on the environment. It yep. depends on the individual and what you're looking for. So there's, as, as Dr. Emmons said, there's not a blanket answer to every individual. Sometimes you need tailor-made one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion. So what I, what I hear you saying that I didn't really realize is that there's a sleep drive that can be somewhat squandered for some people at some times if they nap and that will shift their ability to perhaps uh, be able to fall asleep appropriately or quickly enough. So be careful with that. On the other hand, like you said, 
there may be times when not napping is dangerous and or counterproductive. So it's a situational component. Um, so if you're napping and you're not sleeping, you might try to nap less. I mean, just I'm trying to break this down into ways that people can, can use. Um, it's oxymoronic. It's paradoxical. I'm sleeping all day. I can't sleep at night. But what are you doing all day? I'm sleeping. And then you start piecing it together and maybe start making common sense for that individual's health care plan. Got it. What about um, kids? I've got a, a note here that came in um, from Jane from Montana who asks, my 16-year-old has had two concussions from playing football and now sleeps poorly where they didn't sleep poorly before. Is there a difference in sleep and the consequence? So two things. Is there differences in sleep um, in children versus adults? And is there a difference in the consequence of poor sleep with children and young adults after brain injury? Well, you know, just leading, and I, I know the boss is jumping at the bits, but in mild head trauma, which is sort of the paradoxical, in mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, insomnia is worse. The complaints are from the patient subjectively are worse than in moderate to severe, whereas sleepiness is bad for everyone. But that's sort of the paradox. And the youngsters also, the more repetitive concussion, and we know about the concussion syndrome that's been on the TV, et cetera, there's more microscopic damage, that that insomnia tends to be worse with multiple injury. Right. I was the uh, uh, doctor for the Taekwondo club here at the university. My, my kids and I were all on the team for a variety of reasons. And uh, when one kid would be hit in the head with a concussion, that was it. They then did forms. Never again can they afford to be hit in the head because there is microscopic brain injury. And the more you get, the worse the insomnia can be. And it's usually the insomnia. And the kids also tend to get a little bit more of the parasomnia. They often get more bruxism, sleep-related enuresis, you know, wetting the beds. Uh, they have more of the disrupted sleep at night uh, in that regard. Yeah, so I would uh, maybe just like reiterate some of those same points to her first question, sleep is different in children compared to adults. Okay. We know objectively uh, children have a different amount of each stage of sleep when we look at the percentages of their sleep. And they also need a different amount of sleep than adults. So children often need much longer sleep periods than adults. And likely that's because they have a different neurodevelopmental process going on that's uh, related to their age. There are a lot of consequences of brain injury in the pediatric population, and they're somewhat the same as adults, um, sleep disturbances, fatigue during the day, and they're also somewhat different um, and characterized by internalizing behaviors and externalizing behaviors. So something that we frequently see in that pediatric population is they have more externalizing behaviors they misbehave more often. They almost seem hyperactive at times. Um, they're disorganized in their ability to get a task completed. Um, it's a little bit different than adults. Yeah, often a behavior problem that parallels the adult sleepiness. Right, yes. Okay. I think there was also a study too. The more severe the trauma and the earlier if it's associated in a child with sleep-related problems, it often is predictive of more difficulties in childhood. So it's a great thing to address early. And one concussion, I'm sorry, I wouldn't let my, my child, because of that repetitive trauma that's on a microscopic, uh, and these are sleep-related neurons and neurotransmitters. It's the brain, the master system, Treat it gently, and sometimes you become a coach. Nothing wrong with being a coach. Sometimes you do the form, and that happens to football players, soccer players, uh, softball. Softball. I mean, that's a that's a tough sport. They wear helmets for a reason. So the, there's a, a common a story that I hear uh, around 
rural Iowa and beyond that you don't have to worry until you've had your third concussion uh, to, to slow down or stop. You don't think that's true? No, Indiana University used to be the team doctor for the football team. My dad was the chairman of neurology for 23 years, and they stopped the department of neurology. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble from this, from being the team coach, because the rule was one concussion, that's it. Okay. One and, done. one and done. And the thought was every time I saw a kid in Taekwondo for the University of Iowa, I would go over do a full neurologic exam. We wouldn't move them. You'd have the neck brace on. That's somebody's child. The only thing in the world you'd be willing to die for. And I'm glad the good Lord, she has not asked me to do that yet. But my goodness, one and done. You can coach. You can do forms. There's always a way you can enjoy a beautiful sport but in a sport that is prone to head trauma, the risk of a second concussion, no, I would not do that. Okay. On the same uh, theme, there's a question that comes in. Um, when you have a patient with a concussion who is having trouble going to sleep or who wakes frequently, what do you recommend? Do you recommend melatonin or medication or just increased hours of sleeping? What, what, do you, what do you start with? I'll start with this one. And just because I just looked up, uh, I think Dr. Emmett had mentioned, we know that with head trauma, melatonin levels, uh, a well-known soporific sleep-related hormone that we generate when it's dark, are generally affected in regard to when they're released and lower levels. Nevertheless, in traumatic brain injury, melatonin has not been shown to do diddly stink for insomnia and sleep in patients with traumatic brain injury, although it might make sense, but there are other things to do. So the primary recommendation that we have is to avoid medication because they haven't been shown to be efficacious, like Dr. Dykin said, and also you wanna be very gentle with that brain that's already uh, experienced an injury, and you wanna be careful that you're not uh, exposing the brain to some potentially harmful substance that's going to have side effects and other issues with it. So if at all possible, I recommend avoiding medication. Instead, um, we recommend a program that helps recreate good sleep pathways in the brain. And that program is called um, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. We shorten that down to CBTI because it's less of a mouthful. But uh, it really helps it's a neuro um, rehab program, a lot like physical therapy for the physical body um, that helps retrain the brain to be a good sleeper. And thank you. Is that something that um, you'd need clinical guidance for or is there an app for that? So both, I guess, okay. yes is my answer. There, there is an app for that. There are a lot of good apps for that. Most of the apps are supplemental, like the VA has an app um, that they created in uh, working with Stanford and doing that. Um, that's called CBTI. Uh, there are other apps like Sleepio and Shut Eye that you can get as well. Most of the time, especially when there's a another issue going on that makes a person even more unique, like brain injury, sure. I think we have a lot of benefit to working one on one with a trained clinician. Okay. So and it's, it's funny as you ask, though, there are 5,234,692 different things that can cause insomnia. So what Dr. Emmon is implying, once you've ruled out apnea and 5,234,600, and I probably don't have that number exact, but there's a lot of different things. You've done the full history. You've looked under the hood. You've seen the patient. And you've ruled out anything else like a primary sleep disorder, apnea, where you're not breathing, restless legs. Uh, and you've looked at well-known comorbidities, severe depression, anxiety. People with traumatic brain injury get depressed. And that's the best therapy rather than a back rub or a CPAP mask. It, you want the right therapy for the right disorder. But there are these neural units for insomnia and sleepiness. And when you get down and everything else is ruled out, there are people that are left suffering from sleepiness or insomnia. And sometimes if a medication has to be thought of, 
like to help sleep for someone who has insomnia. We know melatonin and sunlight, it made sense, but it has not shown to be efficacious in studies. And sometimes in those patients, the well-known benzodiazepine medicines, uh, they might be just as efficacious, but if there's a cognitive effect, then it's almost like Alzheimer's disease. A paradoxical effect can happen. You can make behaviors much worse, sundowning much worse, and it, it, and that can be potentially very, very dangerous. So especially if there's a parallel in cognitive impairment. So for elderly patients without brain injury, giving these classic sleep medicines, as we've implied, can be very dangerous. Then for the people who are sleepy during the day, there's a term called, I think I have this right, pliosomnia. And the thought is people with traumatic brain injury need more sleep. That's the thought. And they generally are getting one to two or more hours prior to brain injury of sleep. They're trying to sleep longer, but in this fast society, going back to sleeping their six to seven hours, they may need, need eight to nine hours. So. Mm -hmm. And the thought was, well, how do we fight that? How do we treat that? Well, we'll give them a stimulant therapy. So the experts from Harvard, Dr. Scamell, did a recent review, said if you have to use a medicine, ruled everything else, maybe the modafinils, the armodafinils, maybe. But he said, think about this. Why is there pliosomnia? And I talked about it. We need sleep to keep alive. And we believe at the University of Iowa, with some of the research we're doing with Dr. Bloomberg from Seashore Hall, that sleep allows restoration and repair. And the reason a brain injured person may be sleeping two hours is Mother Nature insisting on repair. So if you're taking the stimulating medications, you're fighting repair. So medicines. We use them very, very judiciously, not because we want our patients to suffer, but because if I'm doing a long-term damage, not allowing for repair, so get as much sleep as you can. Thank you. There's two questions that came in uh, as we're talking about this. Uh, Peggy Reicher from Nebraska on uh, medication says that her sister has given her a tincture of valerian that her sister purchased from a natural food store. Will that make any difference? And are there other natural remedies or treatments that might help or might not harm me? You know, I, I was just talking to Dr. Eman because uh, we were talking, uh, there's these animal studies, not human beings, but we're animals too, but they're mice or rats. Uh, and they gave these branch chained amino acids. So I don't take much of anything. And I said, this valerian, uh, and there's a lot of herbal medicines that people swear by, it works for them, you know? Uh, so, you know, ginseng, whatever it might be, but a lot of these have branched chain amino acids that in animal studies have improved in mild to moderate traumatic brain injury in animals, uh, the ability to stay awake during the day, uh -huh. but that have not been studied in human beings to any great extent, but what is it? Tell me about valerian. So valerian, a lot of people do try it, um, and... I typically, if someone's already has tried it or on it, um, we talk about what their experience has been, if they're doing better with it, if they notice side effects. Um, just like medication, I don't think because it's herbal doesn't mean there isn't a risk. And so you have to be very careful that you're not exposing an already injured brain to further um, negative stimuli. So. Um, valerian root is natural. Um, I don't think it, we know universally it's going to work the same for everybody, but on a case-by-case -case basis, you can review it. Um, the other thing that we find with herbals is they are often um, inconsistent um, time to time and uh, company to company, each product is different. There's not FDA regulation of these substances either, so you need to be a little bit careful that you are um, taking what you think you're taking. Okay. So. Bioavailability. Uh, you know, we had talked about that with melatonin. A buddy of mine had looked at that. Melatonin in the United States is a dietary supplement officially. And in Canada, it's a restricted research drug. So the amount 
of melatonin you get in anything over the counter is quite variable. And my buddy had done a review of this many, many, many years ago. Mm. And most melatonin is very short acting in, in the United States, dirt cheap. Mm. When he looked at the different products, there was like anywhere from 0% to 10 times the physiologic effect. And if you read some of the literature, and it's not the deepest science, there are some concerns about melatonin, especially in youngsters. Mm, I've seen that. So a couple of things that, that just I want to regroup on. For supplements, because they, they don't have the same oversight that uh, prescription medications would, you, you're not always as clear about the, the dosage or the active ingredients are in there. You're not clear about what might be in there that shouldn't be in there. The, and perhaps if they're pill forms, um, whether or not they're uh, encapsulated in something that's been released. So there's, it sounds like it's a, it's a complicated landscape. But all that said, I also hear you, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Rachel, saying that you wouldn't scream, flee screaming from valerian um, as a as a death drug. No. Okay. Or, or Dr. Dement with his TV. You know, it's interesting. When you have something that's relatively benign yep. and you have conditioned to whatever it is and it works for you, and what you want to make sure is – don't screw up the patient. First in a harm, my goodness gracious, it's working for them. They've got control. And that's very, very important. Uh, I had a, a truck driver buddy of mine who was one of these presentations similar to this who said he used a shredded wheat in the morning. It made a bright and bushy tail the rest of the day and nothing wrong with shredded wheat, a lot of fiber. And a lot of this is holistic and it's working well and first in a harm. Okay. And that's very much appreciated. When we talk with uh, physicians, we totally realize that you have that as a, as a core mandate. Um, and then for those of us who are, are not licensed healthcare professionals out here, um, oftentimes without good access, either financial access or geographic access, you know, this, this half of our lives that we're supposed to kind of uh, fall out of the womb being able to sleep regularly, um, just trying to navigate that gets, get, can be pretty interesting. Here's one that's in your neck of the woods, uh, Dr. Dyke. And um, a gentleman writes that my spouse tells me I snore much more since my car crash. Could that be keeping me from deep sleep? Parentheses, I know it's keeping her from deep sleep. So when we hear the complaint snoring, we think about obstructive sleep apnea. It's just so common. What is obstructive sleep apnea? So many of us, and I have obstructive sleep apnea, and I blew out most of the vision in my right eye because of apnea. It's mm -hmm. not good to have apnea. So I have enough redundant tissue in the back of my throat that it's surrounded by muscle. Muscle relax when we go to sleep. And in the deepest stages of sleep, the back of my throat closes off. And when I suck in, it's like a wet straw. <laughs> That's obstructive apnea. So I'm breathing in as hard as I can, and I'm getting low oxygen to my heart, to my brain and to my eye. So uh, visual loss, stroke, heart attack, and we've actually published only witness deaths from sleep apnea. John Candy, Andre the Giant, Jerry Garcia, Carrie Fisher. We're the writer's workshop. When Princess Leia died, Reggie White, Green Bay Peckers, we can all name somebody who's died from sleep apnea. Millions of us with apnea, you need air and sleep to keep alive. So when I hear snoring, I would do a sleep study. There are new home sleep apnea tests that you can do overnight. We'll have it read in a couple of hours. And if you get low oxygen at night, we're gonna know it. Well, what if you just snore like a banshee? There are therapies for snoring, but uh, if you don't have apnea, you can snore without apnea. But my goodness, I, I wanna stay in the room with my spouse. Uh, and I've got to tell you, if I didn't have my CPAP on, uh, it's loud. Uh, the kids, which are adult now, they wouldn't go on vacation with us anymore. I'd be sleeping alone, blind in both eyes, and uh, potentially dead. And I tell you, it, Princess Leia really bothered us. Uh, we were big fans of Star Wars. And when your heroes 
and they represent our relatives. They represent the people we know. Uh, they often are the biggest advocates and movers and shakers for treatments of other underlying sleep disorders. So 25% of people with traumatic brain injury, that's the prevalence rate. About one out of every four is going to have significant and obstructive sleep apnea. So this comes in as well. A um, uh, gentleman writes, my doctor wants me to do a polysomnograph where they measure the brain waves when I sleep. I believe this is not needed by definition because TBI changes brain waves. Is this expensive, energy consuming, time consuming test? Is that a good idea? Oh, the, and my thought is um, polysomnography actually measures a lot of different things. The brain waves, eye movements, muscle tone. That combination is how you diagnose sleep apnea. So it really has nothing to do with your brain waves, except it tells us the different stages of sleep. And as my students said today, so we're neurologists, and we see people who have seizures, who are on medications, whose normal brain waves are not normal. We put people into coma to keep them alive all the time. And my thought is they have no brain waves, but we know they're alive. But the brain waves are part of polysomnography, but we're watching your breathing and we're looking at see if you stop breathing. And for Medicaid, Medicare and third party payers, they're not doing polysomnography, a sleep study to look at your brain waves. They're trying to see if you have apnea because so many people have it and if they treat it, you're going to be a cheaper customer for that insurance company. You're going to have more returns to society. You're going to be more functional. And for traumatic brain injury uh, and for dementia, higher risk of apnea. And when you treat it, often quality of life improves. So sleeping poorly from apnea, as I heard you say, can cause stroke. Um, or the lack of oxygen uh, from apnea can cause brain injury. And the flip side is having had a brain injury can increase the risk of sleep apnea. So this is a and right out there that you'd pretty much need a clinician to get access to, correct? Yeah, uh, you would need um, an ARNP, mm -hmm. a PA, okay. a DO, an MD. Those are uh, APPs, advanced practice pract uh, providers. There are a lot of people who can see you as a healthcare professional sure. and make these recommendations for polysomnography. And the point, and I've been so proud of medicine's going to be so good in five years when they bring together the system approach and the common sense. It's happening. Okay. You can do a home sleep apnea test that is so much cheaper than being in the laboratory. Now, some of our sicker patients and, and our kids yeah. uh, are a little more difficult and we do facility based in the hospital, if you will, uh, sleep studies. But we can set a person up, they can come visit the clinic, we just put it on them, show them how to put it on, they go home, sleep, bring it back the next day and we'll have a diagnosis. Medicine, I think, will become more affordable and I think people will live better lives, longer lives, higher quality. So a lot of us do not like the smell of alcohol swabs and the sight of the hospital. It's scary, especially if you can't afford it. My people are all farm people, and they figure well, only people in our family ever want to see doctors are dead because that's the only time we would go because we couldn't afford them. So I'm empathetic to that. Medicine will become more affordable. I don't know if it's true, but I've got to believe that in my heart, and the home sleep studies are a great improvement, so don't be frightened. Have them set it up, take it home, get your sleep study at home, and take a look at that, because that's what we're worried about, sleep apnea. We'd like to treat it. Thank you. What about the uh, folks who sleep with, and, and this is another comment that comes in, uh, because I think I mentioned it when I introduced you, Dr. Eman, restless leg syndrome. What the heck is that all about, and, and is there anything to do for it? Absolutely. So restless leg syndrome, for anybody who has it, they know immediately what I'm talking about, but a lot of people may not have heard it or even have the experience but don't know that it's called something. Mm -hmm. So um, to define it first, it's an uncomfortable urge to move the legs. It's uh, oftentimes like deep, like people feel it in their bones, but an uncomfortable urge to move the legs. It's commonly worse when you're sitting not moving gets better if you move your legs around. And typically it's worse in the evening and at night. So it's a big disruption to sleep for people who have it. Um, restless legs is another thing. There's a lot you can do about it. Um, 
one really important thing that I'm going to point out that every person with restless leg should have evaluated is iron levels. Iron. And, um, people with restless legs more likely have low iron and by restoring iron levels, they oftentimes have improvement of their restless legs. And we see that so much that we call iron our most powerful medication for restless legs. Let's, let's pause there for a second. Is this something the treatment would be as simple as taking an iron supplement or sucking on a rusty nail? What, what are the options? So rusty nail is lower on the list, but I guess it would give you some iron. Uh, yes, an iron supplement over the counter, we say on an empty stomach with vitamin C because it gives it the best absorption is okay. a great starting place. Some people have trouble absorbing the iron, and so we may need to adjust that or even go to IV iron, whatever it takes to get that iron improved. Okay. Yeah. And so a blood, test, a blood test could show that. Absolutely. And another thing um, that I'll point out is a lot of times people will go to a general practitioner, get their iron checked, and they are told, eh, it's, it's fine, it's okay. But for people with restless leg, we have a higher standard. We know uh -huh. they get their iron even to a higher level than is usual, they have improvement. So most of the time people with restless leg need to be taking iron. Thank you, that's very helpful. Are there, are there other things that if, if, uh, if the iron levels were moderated or uh, improved and it still persisted, uh, are there subsequent things to consider? There are, so there are many medications that are tried to help mm -hmm. with restless legs. Unfortunately, not all of them have good evidence. They don't work long term and they cause a lot of secondary issues. Ah. Our gold standard medicine most of the time is gabapentin, okay. which um, many people will be familiar with and know that in uh, folks who have brain injury, it's, it actually has some other uses and benefits. Yeah. And so uh, it could be a good option. Okay. Well, well, wait a second, what about dopamine and cinnamon? Yeah. Well, what it, uh, it, that's such a simple medication mm -hmm. and it's so cheap. So there are a lot of medicines that work on dopamine in the brain and historically have been used for restless legs, but we find that they cause far more problems um, than they solve. And it's again, in the population of folks who have had a brain injury, I would be even more worried about um, kind of messing with dopamine levels. I would avoid any dopamine medication. Got it. So the medication, um, and I, I don't mean to wander too far, but I'm trying to focus on a few questions as we come down to the bottom of the hour. Um, we've been talking about the untoward effects of some medications that may actually be very important. There's a, a woman who uh, mentions that her husband is on large doses of anti-seizure medications. Uh, obviously, many people with brain injury, somewhere between 5% will have um, seizures after brain injury. Uh, she's asking, could that impact his sleep? Oh, yeah. But it's, there is probably, and as we've alluded to, I think some of my, my, my colleagues at Stanford, Dr. Guillaumeau, uh, who is one of the icons of sleep medicine, is sort of where the rock stars are for sleep medicine. There's not hardly a medicine that doesn't mess up sleep. It has an effect, and these are centrally active, and the anticonvulsants especially, but you need them. So when we say don't take, avoid all unnecessary medicines, oftentimes you're in a bit of a rock and a hard place, and there can be negative effects of almost any drug on sleep. It's best to go holistic if you can, but for seizure, sleep, exacerbates the tendency and the severity of seizure. The first third of the night, usually what we call end to sleep, and it can be life-threatening. And in fact, my chairman, Dr. Richardson, does a lot of research on sun and explained death and sleep. Often it's in sleep. You need those medications, so it's a relative element. Dr. Dykin said to use a medicine that might affect sleep in this. Yeah, so, Everything needs to be tailor-made. And, you know, there are even some people who have low cholesterol levels. And uh, for them, a Big Mac is uh, <laughs> vitamin of the day. Uh, that's not me. But, uh, yeah, it's rock and a hard place. And since seizure is so prevalent, predominant, and exacerbated by sleep, 
even though it may affect the quality of the sleep, uh, the benefits far outweigh. But on occasion, you do want to see those experts who say, I know that's affecting your sleep, but we do have a different anticonvulsant that might be just as good and have less insomnia effects uh, for you. Okay, well, that's really helpful. So um, go back to your provider, your medical provider, if there are some sleep issues relative to, in this case, a thousand milligrams of Chepra, and and ask uh, that is the you know the the benefit of this versus the sleep is there something else we might be able to try yeah and, and continue to try to make soup with uh, our bloodstreams okay well you guys do that so well and I and very much are appreciated I I know that there is this uh, frustration after brain injury and I'm a family member of wanting to have the answer but this issue of the constellation of answers and and to have to try and maybe not succeed and try again and try again until we find something it takes patience. It takes many trips to providers. It sometimes takes more co-pays than we want, but there may not be another way to get there from here. Um, last question probably, it's about sleep cycle. Do you have any tips for people who have had a severe traumatic brain injury and have an inverted sleep cycle? Um, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, in fact, the number one, they're a circadian rhythm problem. So an irregular sleep-wake cycle is often what we see because the biologic clock is in the brain in this area called the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Keeps us daytime awake, nighttime sleepy. But when you pop the brain, you can really injure that to an extent. And what you want to do is make sure you don't do what I did as the nursing assistant. Pre severe tra traumatic brain injury, let my patient sleep. Because sometimes it may not be that circadian rhythm problem, it's a nursing effect. And God bless them. Uh, nursing care for the elderly, my parents are in their 90s, mother-in-law, mom, she's 97. They just happen to be blessed with excellent nursing care where if they, without brain injury, were left to sleep all day, their nights would be horrific and they would be placed on medicines that would have negative side effects. So one of the biggest things is to keep active during the day, to be as normal as possible, not to let that comorbidity of depression, anxiety, which is there with traumatic brain injury and that tendency to let me just drink, let me take that drug, that quick fix uh, across the counter uh, that's sedating me during the day uh, to not get out anymore. Uh, I, I can't get employment now. I, I don't want to be seen. I'm a different person uh, to face life, you know, boldly with a support system. And for those who are alone, uh, who can't get them out for that walk that you and I have talked about so often at midday, gosh, that can be therapeutic. But sometimes there can be a disruption to that level. But the first thing clear up all those primary things, address the depression, address the anxiety, address the nursing care issues, address the medications. And if we're left with that, what do you think? You've got messed up sleep-wake schedule. Mm -hmm. So um, having circadian rhythm issues, like Dr. Dykin said, is um, common and very problematic. Um, probably the two most uh, significant influencing factors that you can do beyond correcting your schedule and your pattern of behavior is bright light therapy exposure, uh, like Dr. Dykin said. So if you aren't able to get outside, that's doing artificial bright light therapy exposure with a 10,000 lux light. And then while melatonin is not helpful necessarily for sleep onset and insomnia, melatonin can sometimes be helpful in uh, fine tuning the circadian rhythm. Yeah. So low dose melatonin uh, at the right time may also help. What's the right time, Dr. Emin? So it depends on what you're trying to do to your circadian rhythm. Um, if you're trying to push or pull it. Okay. Um, and this might take some experimenting with the individual to find this out. Um, you know, if you're thinking usually if you're going to take it to help with sleep onset, you might take it a half an hour or an hour before um, your typical bedtime. But if you're trying to pull your sleep to an earlier time, we're looking at taking it much earlier than that, even two or three hours, it, it quite a bit depends on the precise uh, details 
of the current sleep pattern. Okay. So if you had the other major circadian rhythm, the delayed phase, so people with traumatic injury often stay up later and later and then sleep and later and later, what would you recommend? Everybody else in the family is going to bed at 10 and they're right. going to sleep at two. So if someone's going to sleep at two or three in the morning and they really would like to have their sleep pulled back closer to 10 p.m., I would suggest trying to take that melatonin at nine or 10 and, and seeing how that does. Thank you. So that's hours helpful. before. Yeah. That's very helpful. Well, yeah. I, you know, I, I hate to break this up because I'm learning a lot. I feel activated. I'm going to go out after this and there's sun here in uh, central Iowa. So we're going to, Eastern Iowa, we're going to go get some. Um, thank you both so much on behalf of the United States Brain Injury Alliance, our, our state members and our advocate members for taking this time with us. Um, I'd like to remind people that we will push to you a, a link to this archived webinar uh, when it's up and ready. Um, we have an additional number of webinars that are scheduled, including one on um, pain and managing pain after brain injury. And there'll be a series of pediatric uh, kids and brain injury uh, webinars that we'll have coming over the fall and the summer. From a community-based standpoint, we've got scheduled in late fall or early winter uh, a, a webinar on the TBI clubhouse model uh, that's uh, being uh, used around the country. And uh, on behalf of USBA, I'm Jeff Lauer, uh, Chair-Elect, and thank you so much for uh, joining us. And Drs. Uh, Dykin and Iman, thank you for your time. Thanks, Thanks for asking. It was great. Thank you very much.